Try to use the microphone a bit, I suppose. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Meet the Legions panel. I am Eric Schaefer. I'm the commanding officer of the New England Garrison of the 501st Legion and the commanding officer of Alderaan Base of the Rebel Legion. Um, I have about 15 different costumes between the two organizations. Um, as you'll find, a lot of us do a lot of different costumes. And uh, to my left. Hi, I'm Shauna Odom. Um, I'm the Garrison Event Coordinator for the 501st New England Garrison. Um, I actually have a Stormtrooper, and I also have dual citizenship with my Jawa between Alderaan Base and the 501st. Um, I'm kind of new to the organization, but the love of Star Wars has been there since I was um, a kid. So I'm kind of the one that anytime, as you'll get in later, that you get events for the uh, group to come, you're I'm the one you directly speak to, and I'm the one that trying to get our troopers there for you. So, first question, what is the 501st Legion? Uh, Elevator Speech, we're an international Star Wars costuming organization. We promote Star Wars fandom while helping others through charity work and community service. This is a fancy way of saying that we are adults who dress up in Star Wars costumes, go entertain kids, and raise money for good causes. <laughs> Um, and then on the other side, we have the Rebel Legion. They are also an international Star Wars costuming organization that promotes the Star Wars fandom as well, while helping others through the charity work and community service. Sounds familiar. Yes. <laughs> um, depends on how you want to look at it. You could say these are the good guys or the no. hero heroes. <laughs> I, so it depends on, on what side the force calls to you. You could say which is which on, on our two organizations. Uh, our mission and values, uh, we offer Star Wars costume enthusiasts a global community to enjoy, express, and share their costume talents, promote the quality improvement of Star Wars costumes, and we follow the lead of Lucasfilm Limited by giving back to the community through works of charity and volunteerism. Essentially, it's what we do is create a global costuming hub for everybody who is interested in portraying Star Wars characters to find information about what they're looking to do, people who are interested in the scene, and find ways for you to express your Star Wars love through costume. Um, we also promote a sense of camaraderie around, among our members. So we are, we are a group, but honestly you could say we're a big family. We are a huge family. When you, as you know of any fandom that you get involved with, so what you find is people's within your fandom, they become your family, and that's what we are, and we try to promote that within ourselves. Um, and we also value each member regardless of sex, race, religion, creed, nationality, sexual orientation, or physical handicap. Which means any person can be any character within the Star Wars universe. There is no discrimination against that. Um, I am a female. I portray a stormtrooper. We've had females that have done Han Solo. We've got female Darth Vader's. We've got, you know, males portraying all the other characters as well. No matter what you are, you love Star Wars, come be with us. You get a costume, you're good to go. Absolutely. Some of the best Anakin Skywalkers I've seen have actually been female. Breaking down locally, breaking down worldwide what the 501st, how we organize ourselves, we're divided into small units uh, called garrisons. It's 30 members or more. Um, in, in those garrisons you can have smaller groups, 15 or more members, called squads. Um, if you've only got one person in an area, they can form an outpost, like we have an outpost Antarctica. We have, <laughs> we have an outpost Israel. It's There's like one two. One. Hawaii had one. Hawaii had one. Um, so having less than 15 members does not make or break you. It's just, we'll have like this one lone snow trooper standing out in the middle of the <laughs> going, here guys, <laughs> want a patch? <laughs> um, but a lot of our garrisons um, end up dividing because we have so many members. We have 76 garrisons worldwide. We have 75 squads. Uh, the New England garrison itself has its own sub-squad in Vermont, which recently got approved. The Green Mountain squad, they've got about 20 members up there, so they were able to uh, subdivide and start doing their own thing. Uh, we have 31 outposts, which is just the small member groups, and over 10,000 members worldwide. 
It's to say nothing of the amount of costumes that we have, uh, considering that many of us do multiple costumes. Speaking of the costumes, those are broken down by detachment. We have people who are very focused on specific things. So if you're looking to become a stormtrooper, you join the first Imperial Stormtrooper Detachment. If you want to become Sith Lord, no, it's a Sith Lord Detachment. Clone Troopers, uh, the Jolly Roger Squadron for pilots. If there's a uh, Imperial or villainous character that you want to portray, there is almost definitely somebody out there who's gone, I think I'd like to do that, and started the research for the costume. If they haven't, there is somebody who is willing to help you do it. And that's where we focus a lot of the costuming energy is the detachments, because everything that, uh, the Bounty Hunter Guild is a perfect example where they have got the scratches on Boba Fett's helmet down to the point where they know exactly what kind of needle from what record player was used to make the scratches, the exact diameter and length that they are supposed to be. There is a level of neurosis to a bone effect. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we have two of the best in um, Brian Anderson and Bob Vea locally, and they used to have the uh, Bounty Hunters Guild. But there's a, within each group, there's a fascination with these types of costumes, something about a TIE pilot or a ADAT driver called to this person, and they love to tell you all about their, <laughs> all about their fandom. Um, the Rebel Legion is divided into small units of foster identity, encourage teamwork and fraternity. So basically the same thing, we have our small <coughs> local groups. Um, bases are the largest units, and they have to have 12 members. Um, for those who are a little bit smaller than the garrison numbers for the 501st, an outpost must have at least three members. So with Fine Fortune Camp 1, you have to have at least three. Bases and outposts cover distinctive geographic regions, the same with ours um, within the 501st. And each base or outpost is a hub of the Legion activity made up of members who often attend events <coughs> together. So a lot of times you'll see it's mainly this garrison, but we do counteract with each other, but it's mainly like your localized area. Um, bases can also create subunits based on costume types to promote unity within the base. So basically, we have like the detachments. We have them with the 501st, we, uh, the, the Rebel Legion, sorry. We have those on the bigger level, and then we also have them on a smaller level as well. Um, with the 501st, all the stormtroopers might get together and be like, yay, woo, squaggles. But when on the Rebel side, we actually have, we actually can say, hey, we do have squads, aha, uh -huh, of <laughs> those little groupings together. Um, there's about 3,500 members worldwide um, within the Rebels, so not, you know, numbers are a little smaller because, you know, everyone does like the bad guys better, just saying. <laughs> there's um, something that calls about shiny white armor. <laughs> there is, trust me, it, it's so pretty. Um, we have 51 bases worldwide and 23 outposts. So as you can see, it's not as spread as much as the 501st is. But it's one of those things that's growing, it's gonna get there eventually. And I think, you know, with the love of Star Wars and its resurgence here recently, I think it'll, it's gonna end up growing. I think part of it too is the, we call them face characters. So they're basically the, the heroes of, of the story and you're Luke, you're Leia, you're Han. Um, and most people feel more comfortable being behind a helmet or portraying a generic crewman, somebody who could be, be fitting into the background and assisting Darth Vader, as opposed to being <laughs> the star of the show. The Rebel Legion very much caters to the stars of the show. It's the people who want to be Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia, and Rey, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and things of that nature. So the expectation for being one of these icons as opposed to being generic pilot number four is much higher. Um, so in a rebel ship we have uh, nine specific costume detachments within the Rebel Legion as well. Um, we've got, what do we have? <laughs> I can't. So we have like our X-Wing pilots, we have our aliens, we have our smugglers, 
which is where you're going to find your, your Hans and your Chewies. We have the Galactic Senate, which you're going to find Princess Leia, Padme, Amidala, all those. So those are ba are broken down as well on your characters. And within those, of course, even though you might not want to be Princess Leia, there are other Galactic, you know, you can be anyone within that universe. So it's not just those face characters, which makes it really nice because a lot of times I think some of the iconic looks from the Rebels are your Endor Troopers, your X-Wing pilots. Someone could be dressed up as Obi-Wan Kenobi. You might not recognize, but you're going to recognize that orange jumpsuit on, it, on those. So there was a lot of those costumes. And the aliens, which is fun, which is where I have um, the Killick Hyde, is where I have my dual legion ship with, on the 501st side, it's the Crate Clans, which it's named after Darth Crate. And on the Rebel Legion is where us sand people like to hang out and party. <laughs> so speaking of parties, how many of you were at the after party last week? That, that's that's a raise hand of shame. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have seen a couple of, of people walking around wearing like shoulder pads and bandoliers, but you can't really recognize them exactly as oh well, this is this specific character. We have a group called the United Citizens of the Galactic Republic. It's the generic human characters <laughs> that could be that random guy that was wandering around in Tatooine. So if you're looking to do something that is inspired by, so long as it fits within universe, that's the kind of area where you can go. The Rebel Legion does allow a little bit more creativity when it comes to the costumes for generic pilots or generic Jedi, because I have never seen anybody with a green tunic in the movies before. <laughs> but that's approved. You know, we allow that kind of thing so long as it's, it's Earth to me. The local garrison, the 501st New England garrison, we were founded 15 years ago in 2001. We currently have 147 members and 277 costumes between us. Like I said, <laughs> a lot of us do multiple costumes. Uh, I myself go from the crewman. We call this the gateway drug to the 501st because if you are wearing this costume, you can throw one helmet and a uh, pauldron on the front and you're an Imperial Gunner. You can throw a different helmet and some armor on the, the front and you're a TIE pilot. You can put on some gloves and a cap and now you're a reserve pilot. This kind of flight suit can also potentially be used as a base for a biker scout if you want to start building up to that direction. So once you get in with a flight suit, boots, and a belt, you can you will start building your way towards more costumes and more intricate costumes because, well, obviously you can't just have one. <laughs> but once you join, it becomes something of a, of a sickness. Um, the Alderaan base, which is our local rebel detachment, was founded in 2005. Currently, we're sitting at 62 members. We have 119 costumes, and like I said, those little smaller detachments, we have nine of those. So at least in one of those detachments, we have at least three people in each one of those with those specific costumes to garner the smaller little detachments um, within there. And a lot of our members, too, same thing on the Rebel side. They've got their X-Wing pilot. There's some variations they could do on that. The indoor troopers, all of those, same thing. You build one, you start building all kinds of them. It's it's not. You're like, I'm going to build one. No. No. <laughs> it just starts rolling. And then you go to events, and as stuff comes out, you're like, I'm going to build that one next. And I'm going to build that one. And then I'm going to do this one. Well, look, a new movie. And more costumes than I want to do. We did a X-Wing build a few years ago where we got 27 members into X-Wing costumes and basically turned my apartment into a sweatshop yeah. where we were passing, okay, you're going to put on this pocket, sew this on, pass it to the next person who puts on this pocket, pass it on to the next person who puts on this pocket, and just this, this line of uh, people sitting around watching football and, <laughs> and passing flight suits around to create everybody's costumes. Um, speaking of which, frequently asked questions. Where do you get your costumes and props? Everything we have is homemade. Uh, if it is not homemade, it is modified to some degree. Uh, props tend to be collaborative efforts for members throughout New England, and especially locally, but sometimes there's somebody who, for example, the, the uh, Rogue One trailer introduced a new trooper called the Short Trooper. 
And as soon as that hit, somebody started grabbing pictures and sculpting a new helmet. That person happened to be in California. So we started talking to them. We have a small group of people who are interested in doing this costume. And they start collaborating back and forth as this guy's doing the helmets. This other person is making the armor. Another person is making a modified version of the flight suit, et cetera, et cetera. And slowly you piece together costumes. You'll be able to create what you want from a variety of different people. Uh, or we will help you make it yourself. Uh, Jedi costumes especially seem to be something that, uh, if there is a, I, I hesitate to call them simple costumes because there's a lot of detail that can go into them. But they are straightforward costumes where it's something that with a bit of help and guidance, it, it's simple lines to put together on a sewing machine. And if you've never sewn before, we have people who have done it that are happy to show you how. And as far as our props go, the New England Garrison and Alderaan Base are kind of renowned for some of the bigger props within the 501st and the Rebel Legion. Uh, we've done parades with our land speeder, our do bag. Uh, we had a Yoda sculpted and um, uh, the battle droids. We built an Ewok village, which I kid you not, after the parade, we burned. <laughs> <laughs> because it was made of sticks and we could really do nothing else with it. But members played the Yum Yum song and kind of just danced around it because it was fun. Uh, and some of you may have seen Jabba the Hutt here before. This is a life-size version made out of foam and PVC and a latex tongue. And we had a sound system inside so he could go, oh, 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 with people. And we don't have him not all yet, because he now lives in California as part of Rancho Obi-Wan, the biggest Star Wars collection in the world. Uh, we were able to make contact with Steve Sansweet. Some of our members hopped in a U-Haul, packed Sluggy up, and they built a wing onto his museum, and he is the centerpiece. So uh, very proud of our members to be able to not only construct something like this, but get enough recognition to the point where this is now a thing that has a place in the world's largest Star Wars collection. So it's kind of cool. Um, some of the events that we do, we have some bigger, bigger named events and we have some smaller events. Some of our big events, uh, if you've seen any of the Star Wars days, mainly at Fenway Park or some of the local collegiate or semi-pro sports teams, that's usually us. Um, we do a lot with the organizations. Uh, Weird Al Yankovic, how many of you guys have seen Weird Al in concert? Have you seen the Stormtroopers that come on for Saga Begins? That's us. <laughs> That's us. It's always one of our big highlights to come on and hang out with Al and do those concerts. Um, and of course, the big, the big daddy of them all, Star Wars Celebration. Um, I guess you could say that's kind of our, our home our home turf. It's Mecca. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, most people, it's SDCC for us at Celebration. Um, the garrison is there, we're running around, uh, doing all kinds of different events, photo ops, it's kind of our home way from home. And then Dragon Con, of course, is another big one for us, that's where the Legion was founded was at Dragon Con, so that's another big one that you'll always see us um, on the bigger scale events at. So usually at the conventions, we're usually always here, we've always got the booths and that going on. Um, and then, of course, our main bread and butter, the main thing that we do and the reason that we do it are our charitable events. Um, yeah, going and hanging out at Fenway Park is fun. Yeah, getting, you know, to go hang out in back to your house is fun. But it's really about the charity and it's about the kids and bringing smiles to people's faces. Um, some of the organizations that we work highly with, and we work with all kinds of organizations, um, right now we're raising money, of course, for Dana Farber. We've also done a lot, and we do a lot of blood drives with the American Red Cross, the American Cancer Society, Autism Speaks. We do a lot of walks for them. Um, Make a Wish. Um, we just signed an endowment with them, so we've got more information coming along. We just recently did a giant um, Make a Wish wish um, about a month ago now. About that, yeah. yeah, about a month ago, was, um, a young gentleman by the name of Cole, his wish was to have Commander Gree armor. We built him Commander Gree armor, screen-accurate Commander Gree armor for his wish. And he's here today. 
he's uh, actually getting suited up. So if you see Commander Green, green clone trooper armor, wandering around the convention, make sure you say hi to Cole. So that's our, our big things that we do. And anytime we appear, we always ask that uh, charities be made, a donation to a charity be made in our name. And it doesn't matter. If your heart lies with the ASPCA, go for the ASPCA. I mean, we that's what we're here for. We're here to raise money for charity. Um, so any organization that comes through, as long as it's you know charitable, we know it's just not going into somebody's pocket because they want to go fund me to buy a new car yet. No. Yeah. No. We've done small hometown. We need to fund our library events before. Um, six years ago I did St. Baldrick's, which is uh, basically I got my head shaved for charity and it was much longer than it is now. Um, but regardless of the charity, if it's something that sings to you, we'll find a way to hopefully get some troopers there. Um, we do not typically do birthday parties. We do not do um, my family is doing a get together, and I think it would be cool to have Darth Vader there, just because it's not part of of what we do. And I think last year we raised close to six hundred thousand dollars in the name of the five hundred first charity worldwide. Are we part of Lucasfilm and Disney? No, we're not. We're volunteer. We're fan run. But. They recognize us as their preferred costuming organizations. Uh, so what that means is they like us. They say that we can keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> but if we have an X-Wing in Times Square and need X-Wing pilots, they're giving us a call. If they want Stormtroopers for the Today Show, they're giving us a call. If Hasbro is shooting a commercial, they're giving us a call. Um, they don't tend to have their own in-house Darth Vader or in-house Stormtroopers. Why would they? They have these screen-accurate costumes that are right down the block that if they make a donation to charity, most likely we're going to show up. So we've worked out this relationship with uh, Lucasfilm, Disney, and their licensees to the point where they're very happy to have us show up and be part of their what have you because, well, we're how old now? 97, so yeah. we're almost 20. 20. Um, yeah. That over those 20 years, we've established ourselves and have we have such a good relationship with them that they feel comfortable calling us and knowing that we're not going to show up in the Party City X-Wing pilot costume and, <laughs> and do what they're doing. How did that develop? How did that? Slowly but surely, yeah. uh, there were a few people who just had put together their own stormtrooper costumes and then the ball started rolling. They got noticed by Lucasfilm and fortunately we were able to turn that into a positive as opposed to, it is not my intent to defecate upon another fandom, but on the other side of the star spectrum you have Star Trek who seem to go out of their way to prevent people from getting in costume and celebrating their family. Um, organized Star Trek things don't seem to be as big of a deal. And that's because of Paramount, the way that they handle things. Lucasfilm goes the complete other way and is like, no, this is, this is cool what you're doing. Please come promote our product. We like this. <laughs> and because Lucasfilm was the home homegrown kind of company, it was just Lucasfilm. Lucas and people who work for him, as opposed to a company, um, we were able to become friendly with the home type company before it was purchased and before it really exploded into part of that Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilm empire it is today. So how much money do we make? We make nothing. Every single penny that we earn at when you see us at like these cons and stuff, everything that we earn goes strictly to charity. We take no profits from it whatsoever. Um, you do sometimes see fan groups that take a portion, we don't. Anything that we get donated to us for appearing goes straight to charity. So everything that we build, all of our costumes, all of our props, everything is totally 100% built by us, funded by us, and every 
like I said, everything that we collect in donations goes strictly to charity. We take nothing from it, which is unique to some organizations. I've worked with nonprofit theaters before where you take a cut um, and so much goes into your operating budget and stuff, not for us. It's 100% donated. So all of our costumes are made, paid for by us 100% with love, and then we turn around and give everything back. Uh -huh. You should probably answer yes. this question. How this, do all you, you. this is all you. <laughs> so how do I get you to attend an event? So if you go to our website, either 501NEG.com or AlderonBase.com, you'll see a little tab that says Request an Appearance. There's a nice little form to fill out. It's really simple. It's name of the event, the date it is, the time, how long it runs, what type of event is it. Um, we even have on there specific character requests. Um, is there a place to change? We kind of need that. Because um, we like to keep the mysterious. Like if you go to Disney, you're never going to see Mickey Mouse with his head. You're never going to see Donald Duck running around without his head. Off. Same for us. We like to keep that magic alive. That when we walk out of that back room, it's a stormtrooper. It's Boba Fett. It's Darth Vader. We are 100% on. So we like to always have that magic. Um, You're never well. going to see Darth Vader chain smoking behind the uh, <laughs> It's not going to happen. Yeah. No. Um, and also, anything specific requests for characters? Maybe there might be a maximum. Maybe it might be a small library that you can only fit X amount of people in. So you know that I can maybe only have three or four people there. Um, and then it comes to me. I look it over, see if there's any other questions that might arise. Like if it's a parade, like how long's the parade? What time's lineup? What time's step off? How, you know, what's on this? Or um, and then we post it to our troopers. We see if we can get them there, and then we, you know, let you know if we can make it, yes or no. Usually, I like to let everybody know about two to three months in advance. Sometimes if they need it for, um, you know, promotion wise, it's there. We do have certain things we cannot come to. We cannot come to your store opening. I'm opening a comic book store. Hey, can you guys show up? No. Free comic book day, we can come. There are restrictions, and at that time, with those, those will be handled. Hey, my school's having, you know, a Star Wars day fundraiser, basket bingo, so we can get some new, you know, gym equipment. That's an okay. We can try to come to that. So and usually I will always um, have correspondence with you for any of those questions and what's going on. And also there are sometimes restrictions on what you can say is going to be there, if we're going to be there, how you can word it, what can't be worded. If it is a sporting event, because you might run a collegiate team or a high school team and stuff, there are other permissions that have to be granted from Disney Lucasfilm. I will also get you those to make sure you're all the up and up so nobody gets in trouble anyway, because we don't want anybody to get in trouble if they didn't get it or even if you guys are hosting a film festival and you're like guess what we're going to kick off this film festival and we're going to show the force awakens that kind of thing it's okay with the permission but we always make sure that everybody is 100 percent set so nobody falls beneath the cracks and we can get everybody even keel on that if you're interested in joining the legions uh we've got a couple of requirements minimum age you have to be at least 18. uh costume Professional grade, screen accurate, Star Wars costume, Imperial Sith, creature, denizen, otherwise evil character, if you're looking to join the 501st. Um, we basically refer to it as the rule of three. You must be 18 plus. You must have a screen accurate costume. You must do one event a year, rolling year. So if I do this this year, I'm still a member until this time next year. And then it's, Hey, hey, could come out, you can come play. <laughs> Just to make sure that this is something that you're still interested in, you're still participating in, you're still, your costume's still on this stuff. <laughs> right, with the Rebel Legion, um, same thing, the minimum age for membership is 18 or um, higher if required by local law. The costume is a formal professional grade Star Wars costume. And it has to be either in a rebel, a hero, creature, rebel supporter, or a good guy costume if you still believe that they're the good guys. And the whole entire saga. So, like we said, we went over the detachments earlier. So the X-Wing pilots, the Andor troopers, if you want to be Princess Leia, if you want to be Padme, if you want to be Queen Amidala, all of those guys. Just make sure, you know, you're 18, we can get you there, get you going. And there are certain costumes that are 
by legion. So you can be both a member of the Rebel Legion and the 501st. Clone Troopers, for example, they're good guys at one point, Order 66, and now they're aligned with the bad guys. So what does that mean? Are they good guys or bad? No, they're both complete. <laughs> Jawas, well, they didn't necessarily kill anybody, so they're not <laughs> bad guys. But they did kind of try to stiff Lo <coughs> and, and Luke. So, man, they're not good guys. They just come by. So, if you're interested in portraying a character, some of them will kind of blur those lines a little bit, and you can be a member of both organizations and work the concepts. This is why I am with my jealous. It's my, as I call it, my dual citizenship. <laughs> uh, if you're looking for more information, our websites, or you, you know, just put into Google Star Wars New England, or like the second thing that pops up, <laughs> pretty easy to find. So we're going to throw open to any questions, anything that you guys uh, might be interested in, uh, and we have to right there, please. Um, <clears throat> when requesting, how long uh, should, how much time should you ask beforehand before the event? I usually will start posting about two to three months ahead of time, depending on what time of the year and the event is. Um, right now, I've already started posting Star Troopers some of our October, November events because we're going into the release with Rogue One and a lot of that stuff. And a busier time of the year with you know holidays and everything going on. Um, that way, it has plenty of time to get up to see if there's interest. Um, summer especially is our busiest time, so we have a lot of events. So I usually say anywhere from three to four months. As soon as I get the email request, I usually will let you know like it's going into the queue and about how much time. And then I usually always try to keep in contact to let you know where it's at. And um, usually I try to always make sure I have a date of when you need to know exactly when you need to know why so that way I have an answer to you. And then when I pose that to the troopers too, I'll be like, all right, guys, this is this event. It's coming up. I need to have a definitive answer by this date to let the contact know. So too long didn't listen, get it to us earlier rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else? Questions? So I'm going to call an audible here. Uh, we had a question the last time that we did this panel that I'm going to ask you. Okay. What is the worst event that you've ever been to? <laughs> <laughs> That would be a, a, a paid Hasbro. <laughs> that was, um, if there was ever the term cluster could be used, <laughs> that was it. But the way I look at it, I was like, we made it through it, we trooped through it, we did what we did, and we have battle stories to go with it. So it was quite entertaining. It has been known to become story time with Shauna, if nobody's yeah. heard what's going on. <laughs> it's like, everybody gather around, grab a drink, here we go. <laughs> Um, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of miscommunication on both parties, not really miscommunication on what was going on. We get there, everything changes, and my two troopers I was with, we decided we're going to stick this out because that's what we do. It was Hasbro, it was Hasbro, so we were like, we got to do it, we got to do it. And then it just kind of went downhill pretty fast, and the only thing we can do now is look back on it and laugh, and it was a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot, and it was... You know, when the first thing we get told is the venue got changed and we're stormtroopers and we're going to the Rebel Lounge, we're like, okay, <laughs> this only can go down sign. here from the It's only sign. going down. Um, so, my turn. <laughs> I did a minor league baseball event outside of New England. And I was wearing my uh, 181st TIE pilot costume. So I've got the armor and the helmet and red stripes down everything and just looking very top gun. This kid walks up to me, he's kind of smiling and happy and just, hi, how you doing? You're a bad guy. <laughs> and if you're familiar with how how high a six or eight year old punch is, <laughs> I used to be able to sing bass. <laughs> Not as much. <laughs> we have a question from our live audience. Tim asks, what was your favorite troop? Favorite troop? Um, oh my gosh. Probably, I had one, I was dressed as my Jawa in a Home Depot. 
Um, so I was stealing bolts, boxes of nails. I was carrying bags of sand around, trying to make a home. At one point, I started ro roaming the store with a shot back, being chased by stormtroopers. So it's truth like that where you get to goof off and be silly. That one was probably the most amusing that I've had so far. Um, I have a happy tale, sad tale, which which kind of like it's it's really cool and really happy, and then it has this eh, moment, but then it gets better. So to ride the wave with me, um, we have a member that unfortunately passed in January from cancer, Justin Manning, and when we found out that he was getting sick and that he was not going to be able to attend any more events. We had a small crew of members who built a life-size Millennium Falcon cockpit, put it on a trailer, turned it into a float, sewed him an Obi-Wan Kenobi costume, an old Ben costume, and found a way to make sure that he was able to do one last troop with us, that he was able to participate in the Hoover and Halloween parade last mm -hmm. year, and was able to sit in the, the cockpit and wait, because we knew that it was going to make that much of a difference to him, that it was going to be that important to him to be able to see his friends and participate one more time. And the amount of pride that I have in this group that they saw a member who was suffering, they saw a member who was in pain, and made absolutely sure that they got the chance to make sure that the legions were a part of his life one more time. Absolutely fills me with pride. And the fact that we were able to pull everything together and are still celebrating him today, he's who we're raising money in memory of over at our booth trash compactor um, for Dana Farber in his memory. We've uh, constructed a memorial for him at, uh, there's a facility at Yaki Way, Fenway Park, that Dana Farber has just put together. You'll be able to find his name on the wall. It's sad, it's upsetting. We lost somebody, but I am absolutely enthused. I am filled with pride in the New England garrison and all the rock base that our members came together and we you mentioned it before we're a family unfortunately that means on occasion somebody is the uncle that you don't want to invite to thanksgiving these things happen but it did not matter everybody who wanted to be a part of this pitched in everybody was happy to make sure that he got this opportunity and uh, again just i I'm, I'm floored with how fantastic a group this is that can pull together and make things positive for somebody. Point question type thing. All right, Jonathan's asking, what's the diversity of our group by uh, ages, genders, etc.? Uh, 18 plus and all over the place. Um, because we don't discriminate, um, we you, you do not have to be a 18 to 35 white male to be a member of either legion. Um, we have every ethnicity, every height, every weight, every orientation. It doesn't matter what language you speak or anything else. Do you like to play Star Wars? <laughs> That's it. So do, do I have numbers of, well, this many of this ethnicity versus, no, I don't. But we're, the, the commonality of love for Star Wars just kind of transcends that. And anybody who, who cares about these characters wants to portray these characters in a play. Do you, um, I teach middle school art, and I'm always intrigued with the artistic point of view. And I'm sure everyone in your legion and everything is highly artistic. Um, do you ever hold local events uh, that are open to the public to talk about what goes into making costumes to kind of like something, something sort of, sort of like the panel that you're on now, um, but just like random local events. Yes and no. Um, we'll if somebody is interested in doing what we do, 
-hmm. We ask that they join the forums, mm -hmm. and we hold what we call build dates. And we invite anybody who's interested, any cadets, uh, to come check out what we're building, ask questions, do the different, you know, song and dance about well, what, what is this? How does this go together? What are you cutting? And why did you just curse when you cut that thing? The, uh, just to make sure that this is something that they're really interested in. Uh, and typically people get really interested and involved when they see the sewing machine going, the table saw running, the Dremel going, somebody's sanding this, somebody's painting that, and a backyard turns into a workshop. Uh, fortunately, build days also have a, another component, which is the social one. Because as soon as the sun goes down, last time that we had a build day at my place, it turned from, oh, well, well, we should probably stop working because uh, we can't see. Let's go have a bonfire. And then it turns into story time with Sean or story time with Gary. Or, and we'll sit out there, we'll order pizza, we talk, we just enjoy each other's company. And not just the building, but the social aspects of the group make things a lot better. But we ask that you join the group and express an interest in costuming and being a part of legions, and then we open up these potential events to people. Yes? How do you use some of the more makeup heavy costumes? Like I'm thinking the Twi'leks, um, the Sopatano. You know what? Um, we have. You said you went to the party last night? Yeah. Joy, come on. <laughs> Joy was one of our Twi'leks last night at the party. Yeah, I mean, they and, were fantastic. And she can speak to more of the uh, the, the face paint kind of what happened. Um, so there's um, a couple different paints that you can buy. Um, like some are like nicer and like less sticky, and some are a little bit cheaper and a little bit more sticky. But <laughs> <laughs> um, there's like you know there's like a lot of tricks um, to making that stuff like better and more even. Um, we all um, did it together to help like paint each other and kind of double check each other. Um, but we just like ordered the paint online. It's an alcohol based paint, which is really nice because that way um, you know you're not like leaving purple trails or blue trails <laughs> wherever you're going. Um, and then um, you just kind of get it off with like rubbing alcohol. So that's how like that's how we do the toilets around here. Um, there's a lot of different ways people do paint and people apply the paint. Um, but again, I think if you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's a ton of people that have already kind of done the trial and error for you. And so kind of hopping online and kind of like sharing what you're excited about. Um, I think people are always happy to like have to offer advice and to, to get other people involved. We're very fortunate that ladies like Joy have taken what other people have learned and turned it into, like the Twi'leks that you saw last night. Um, seven years ago, eight years ago, my wife did one of the first Twi'leks uh, that we had locally. Big purple Twi'lek dancing kind of costume and painted her purple. The paint wasn't quite right and by the time that we got back to the hotel room and got it all off, it looked like somebody had slaughtered Grimace and found it. <laughs> so the ability to have people who have gone through this kind of thing before and have that level of, of mastery, like joy, and like uh, Koi Fish Asylum is another one of our members. You'll find her booth right across from ours over at the Armory. She's another member who does fantastic work with the paint. And uh, yeah, they've just been, been doing an amazing job. Do, do you want to sit down there? Up here. Okay. Can I sit here now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What are the, uh, sorry. What are generally the most expensive costumes to make? I mean, face characters. Yeah. Um, your your Boba Fett's, your Vader's. Uh, we don't tend to say it will cost you X to make a particular costume because. My Jedi that I was wearing yesterday, to make that cost me about $25. Because I had the, I bought the fabric, and that's what the cost was. I already had the boots. I already had a belt from another costume. I had some leftover leather from another costume. I was able to use a lightsaber that I got from somebody else in a trade. Total, val total cost, 
20 bucks, what would it actually be worth? A lot more. So you can make a Boba Fett for three, four hundred dollars, but you can also make a Boba Fett for six grand. So uh, my, my most expensive costume, it's kind of back and forth between my Republic Commando, which I actually took a loan out uh, when I refinanced my car and just lied to them about the price. Because <laughs> I really wanted this. Yeah. Is this going on the internet? <laughs> but don't, I've already paid it off. So, uh, don't do that. Yeah, I do not recommend this. <laughs> it's been done, and the 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 you know the it's it's passed. Don't recommend it. Anyway, um, or my general Krell. Uh, which anybody who has watched the Clone Wars uh, animated series, there was a character that they introduced in season four uh, who was a basilisk. He was eight and a half feet tall, four arms, two double-bladed lightsabers, uh, armor, and the Jedi costume. I did this costume. I was eight and a half feet tall with a latex mask and multiple layers of wool and these giant lightsabers and I um, uh, painted stilts that I had uh, sculpted over to make the leg extensions, and I wore it in Orlando in August, and it was oh. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but expense-wise, that probably cost me about sixteen hundred dollars. Didn't do it all at once, but sixteen hundred dollars. So. And what's good is when you sign up. Uh, if you sign up here as student and join, we have a really cool program um, where we assign you a mentor, which is someone that's already made that costume or has experience um, within that costuming area. And they can show you where they've gone to get it, what they've done. There's all kinds of different armor manufacturers out there. Um, I know myself and Joy have both got our husbands their biker scout kits from Studio Creations. And then there's other ones there too, so we can be like, hey, you know, we went here and show you the tricks and tips that we've been like, hey, look, here's this fabric that I use for this, and but I use this, or here's how you can do this, the screen accurate ones, but here's how you can go to Lowe's and go to PVC area and the plumbing department and make it yourself at a, at a reasonable, uh, a smaller cost. Or better yet, I built this thing, and I still have 50 feet of this left over. Yes. <laughs> would, you, would you like to come over and use it, please? <laughs> so it's really good that we have uh, that available, so that way it's always, and everybody's done it differently, everybody's done a different technique, and you can take from that um, and work it together. So there's really no price point. And also when you join, it's not like, okay, you have this costume, you now have four months to get it done and have your first trip. No, if it takes you a year and a half to two years because you're taking your time and it's a slow burn on a costume because it might be really adventurous or something you're not really sure on or you're getting pieces bit by bit, we don't have that. It's when you get it done and you know you get it done and you get it done to the way you, I mean, it's got to look right, but you also want to make sure it fits you. It's something you're comfortable in. And there's sometimes that people have maybe changed their costume ideas halfway through because they realize that maybe they tried on something and they want to do something different that's available as well. My husband did that. He wanted to do a Tuscan Raider at first. He went to a few troops with me, saw some of the guys in the Biker Scouts, and was like, you know what, those guys are goofy. I want to do that one instead. <laughs> and as we've mentioned before about the build dates, another program that we have locally uh, with the cadets is you can attend events that we're doing that are open to the public and wrangle. Um, to make sure, it's always good to have somebody who's not costumed, who has that extra set of eyes, who can see that you just dropped that armor plate and you didn't hear it because you're wearing a helmet, who can pick it up and go, get that back on, or is able to intercept that very happy kid with the foam <laughs> lightsaber that he just built who, who wants to uh, introduce it to you. Um, so having people who have a peripheral vision is always nice and it gives you an opportunity to meet members to figure out what kind of costume that you want to do and how you'd like to be a part of the Legion. Uh, yeah, how strict are the physical requirements for playing heroes in the Rebel Legion, like short beards, height, glasses, face characters? Their height and, well, glasses depends. But that's the only one that I would say can be potentially strict. And that's more of a when you take your photos. 
um, we're not going to say, well, this person has a, a, a stigmatism. They can't be a we want kind of be. It doesn't work like that. Um, <laughs> call anybody out or anything. <laughs> but if we have six and a half foot tall jowls. We have five foot two Darth Vader's. Is it size and accurate? Yes. Are you going to get the call to do the Today Show or Hasbro? Probably not so much because there's going to be expectations for certain things. Um, if so, you go to a school library event, you might be a five foot tall Darth Vader, but guess what? There's a Darth Vader at my school. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Um, so, express your love for your fandom, create what you want to create. Don't let it be about your height or your weight or uh, or any physical limitation that you may be looking to surpass. Let it be about the love of the fandom. But understand that depending on the event, they may be looking for a particular casting call. They may be looking for the nearly seven foot tall Darth Vader. And if you are five foot three, that may not be what they're looking for at the time. So membership, come play. Activity, question. We've got probably time for one, maybe two more questions, because I just got the guy waved the stick at me a little while. <laughs> lightsabers. Yes. What goes into doing the lightsabers? It depends. Um, <laughs> that was also a great question. Uh, so you can potentially purchase a boxed Master Replicas lightsaber from Hasbro.com and turn it on and come play. Or you can do what some of our other members have done and get a lathe and craft your own parts and do your own electronics and solder your own boards and write your own sound clips to put onto those boards. And like with anything, <laughs> it, it goes from zero to legion. So once you get somebody who's really crazy about a particular aspect of something, they will not only put their all into it, but they love you, love to show you how to put your all into it too. Um, we have members who it seems like they have a new lightsaber every month because that's what they make and that's what they do and that's what they love. So, yes. Um, so if you have a character in mind, what are the like actual steps to becoming a member of the Legion or the, the Rebel Legion? So you would sign up for whichever side it was on, and if it's both, you can sign up for both. Um, and then we have uh, what's known as our CRL. I don't know what's it called. Oh, what do you guys have your requirements? It's not CRL. It's just called Cosmic Standards mm -hmm. um, on the Rebel Legion site. Uh, so yeah, so you'll make sure everything looks like that. Make sure that they all meet with those. And then there's a certain set of photos um, that you have to, like front, back, side, and then it's submitted. Um, on the local level, our GML looks over it. On the Rebel Legion, it goes in front of a panel of judges. And then they look at it and they say, okay, yeah, this is good, this is good, this is good. Everything check marks, you're good. Or if there's any improvements or things that need to be adjusted, they will tell you how to adjust it. They won't be like, this is wrong. But they'll be like, you need to just adjust or fix. And then once you get that, then you're good to go. Um, so any of the costumes you have, you can look up the costume requirements or what we call the CRLs. And for whichever character you go to under those detachments, it shows like step by step. And some costumes have a level one, a level two, and a level three, depending on how crazy you want to get. So usually what you mainly want to start out with is that level one. Um, like for FISD, we have the level one, we have the EIV, and then we have Centurion. So I would say if you're going to do a Stormtrooper, start off at level one and then work your way up to EIV or Centurion. And then we've also got all kinds of people that will help you get there on this standard. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, our members are happy to answer them over in the armory, and uh, we'd love to talk to you guys more. And if you guys want to come see, we have the Ladies of the Legion panel at 1 o'clock in uh, Salon, BC, and it um, focuses on what it's like being a woman within the Star Wars costuming uh, world.
Thanks, everybody. Yeah.